major sponsors for Ableton On Air are Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, Allah Israel. Additional sponsors include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International. Welcome to Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled. I'm your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is off today. Thank you to all our sponsors. What you're about to see is part one of Mental Health Awareness Day at Montpelier State House in Montpelier, Vermont. Let's take a look at speeches from Governor Phil Scott and Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman and others. Let's take a look at this. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce someone I think many of you know, and that's Representative Ann Donahue. Morning, everyone. I just slipped out from the House Health Care Committee, which is so packed with people. Actually, half the people are spilled out into the hallway. Um, and uh, Mental Health Commissioner uh, Sarah Squirrel, who I think is on her way down here, uh, was just up presenting. And then the committee will be hearing from uh, many folks who are here for uh, Mental Health Advocacy Day uh, in the next uh, in the next hour or so. But um, you know, on my way in this morning. Well, not actually on my way in because I couldn't read and drive, but I happened to, I happened to be reading this article in the December issue of Counterpoint, just randomly uh, this morning, and I came across this article in it that said, "Reflections on 25 Years of Advocacy." And I thought, "Wow, that's fascinating." I wonder who wrote that article. Um, <laughs> But I looked at it, and it was talking about somebody who said she first encountered peers as support way back in the early 90s. It was the first place she encountered a peer group of support was actually in the hospital. And that was where she began to understand the power of that and became involved, deeply involved, through all those years since then as a leader in peer support, peer advocacy, um, and the whole consumer movement, the psychiatric survivor movement from that time. She co-led the uh, state standing committee for adult mental health services for some 12 years. She was on the Vermont Psychiatric Survivors Board of Directors for so many years in those past 25, she can't even remember when she started, uh, but recently retired as um, the chair uh, still remains active in sort of a, you know, trying to calm down a little bit in all of her levels of activity, still on the uh, um, uh, BCIL uh, board and on the Alyssum board, um, but an incredible leader and an incredible force through all those years. So I am thrilled to have been asked to be the one uh, to present this person with this year's uh, Community Advocacy Award which goes to, of course, Marty Roberts. An incredibly, incredibly deserving person. I just want to thank Anne for that lovely, lovely uh, presentation. And I so much appreciate this award. And I accept it on behalf of all of the folks with whom I've worked over the years, you folks in this room, active in the community, and people in the, in the wider community, uh, people who have spoken out, people have, have advocated, people have worked to bring us all um, health, uh, inclusion, and participation in our community. And I'm so proud to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. I guess. It's uh, sometimes fun 
to end with uh, little known facts about personal history. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Right. So, Marty and I first met many, many years ago at Central Vermont Medical Center <laughs> as inpatients. <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Thanks. Back to work. Okay. And Ann is working all the time on behalf of our issues. Thank you, Ann, so much. Do we see? No, we don't. Okay. Um, we're going to have a number of state leaders come in and speak today, but I don't think any of them are here yet. So I would like to have someone else come up and tell their story, and I'll try to get this right. How about Richard Fails? Richard? Okay. Um, Susanna Yeager? going to sit down the way he said that. I stood and he reamed me out for calling crisis so many times, but no mention of suicidality. And that's what I found on a, on a board high up in the room, little letters, suicide ideation. And so I assumed that's why I was there, but nobody ever told me. Exhausted. It's been 17 months that I have my voice. I've been online. I've been. I've had 19 visits by law enforcement to my house. 
personal welfare safety checks. I've had nine rescue uh, call, come, you know, come to my house. I've had eight voluntary hospitalizations. <coughs> I mean, I went into UVM Medical Center. I don't go to, and I've severed ties with NCSS. I work with the Howard Center now, and thank God for the Howard Center. NCSS did not follow processes as they did not, they were not professional, nor, neither was Northwest Medical Center. They, Northwest Medical said I was cleared medically. They didn't ask me one question, nor did they talk with my providers. I have prolonged QT and many, many, many medications could cause cardiac arrest for me, and that's a slight medical problem. Um, I was suicidal in the spring because I was on a medication that made me suicidal, but I realized I was still calling crisis NCSS. That was my first mistake to call them, and but I called them and and I kept calling and I kept saying I was suicidal, but really what I had was anxiety. I got off the medication. It took three or four weeks to, to um, get the medication out of my system, and, but I just kept on saying I was suicidal when I really wasn't. However, because they never asked me, they never knew. The sheriff deputies who were guarding me knew. They didn't know why I was there. And when I was sent to Brattleboro after seven days with no 12-hour state-required evaluations at all and no initial evaluation, as I stated, when I was sent, the nurses at Brattleboro continuously talked, I talked with them a lot, and they continuously said, we don't know why you were sent here. This has been a traumatic experience for me. It's 17 months out. I, my life has deteriorated. I had plans. I was going to refinance my house, go back to choir that started in mid-September. I had uh, signed up for Seneca. I had a safety plan. I had a safety team. And yet the psychiatrist at Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital said to me that she, I mean, it was definite, it was, it was evident. She had made up her mind that I was going involuntary when I when I got on the little cell phone that NCSS gave me. That is not telemedicine. We had telemedicine in Alaska in the late 70s that was better than what they provided me. It should be a face-to-face, two-way communication. Instead, she interrogated me. She told me she didn't trust me um, at all and that I was confusing her and that I was going involuntary. And I do believe that she'd made up her mind before. Um, right, well, I, I know, I, I could go for months, so. Uh -huh. um, so the <coughs> negligent, negligence and dereliction of duty by Northwest Medical, Northwest Counseling and Support, um, and Vermont Psychiatric Care, I was sent to the I was sent to the most restrictive environment when the commissioner states that we that even prisoners should go to the least restrictive environment. Tell me if I so five more seconds? Five more seconds, absolutely. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm just I try I I had this printed out, but then I had it right. Um the, the petitioner wrote down that I was found at a bridge. He put this in, in the petition, that I was found by the sheriff at a bridge in South Hero, and I said that I was going to go off that bridge. Well, if the petitioner had been in South Hero, he would have known that the lake was dry, and there was no, the tallest bridge was maybe uh, 15 feet off the dry lake bed. Um, there was never any incident with a bridge, but somebody reading that who didn't know would think I was going to go off the bridge, and of course you're going to send me involuntary. There was no bridge, and there were seven, there were like, as I said, there were other critical errors made. Um, 
I wish they had no evaluation. And I think, as I, okay, let's see. What I, my last statement would be that NCSS, Northwest Medical and Vermont Psychiatric Care, committed suicide on me easier, or rather, yes, they committed suicide more than I could have ever committed suicide on myself. I don't have a life. I have a voice. I use it online. And I, and I will continue because I know if it's happened to me, and obviously I know it's happened here, it's happened and is happening to other people. Thank you. see you in the back, Mike. Uh, I want to introduce the first of our, our luminous state folks, and uh, he's new to an old job, um, and uh, how are you liking it so far? It's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and that is our new Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, Mike Smith. Thank you so much. I, the uh, microphone doesn't work very well, so I'll try to project here. Uh, I do want to start off by saying thank you for the people who are brave enough to come up and talk about those instances that have happened to them personally. Let's give them a, ha a hand and an applause. <laughs> Second of all, I do want to read a proclamation from the governor, uh, and then I'll get into uh, some of the things I want to talk about. This is from the governor, whereas one in five individuals are living with mental health condition in the United States, and whereas Vermont, like the rest of the nation, is addressing mental illness and substance use challenges by combining effective promotion, prevention, treatment, and recovery support, focusing on strengths and promoting resilience. And whereas the health, well-being, and quality of life of all Vermonters is impacted by these chronic yet treatable health conditions, and virtually all Vermonters know someone in their network of family or friends who are affected, and whereas Vermont's mental health organizations continue to educate the public and lawmakers about the effects of mental illness and substance abuse and the value of treatment and long-term recovery, building capacity for trauma-informed care and best practice intervention and supports for people living with develop developmental disabilities and whereas Vermont's Mental Health Advocacy Day is designed to remind <coughs> all Vermonters that mental health and substance abuse con use conditions can respond to proper and timely intervention, treatment, recovery, support services, including the support from peers who have had successful recovery experiences, and that people living with developmental and intellectual disabilities are equal members and willing contributors of our communities. Now, therefore, I, Philip B. Scott, Governor, hereby proclaim January 29, 2020, as Mental Health Advocacy Day in Vermont. Let's get it. So thank you very much. And um, as Peter had mentioned, I'm the new old guy. Uh, I had this position 15 years ago. And I've, I've got to tell you, when you have these positions, you go back and you think about your career, never thinking you're going to be back, of course, but you go back and think about your career. And when you're thinking about your career, you think about the best positions you ever had in your career. And I've had a lot of positions in, in my career. The reason when I was going back and thinking, you know what, being Secretary of Human Services is the best and most rewarding experience I ever had. And I never expected to get a phone call and be back here. So you just reflect and say, I wish I would have savored that experience. I wish I would have had more of that experience. 
And here I am within that opportunity. And the reason why is because we all struggle in life. We all struggle with various things in life. And the one thing that we always have is help sometimes. Now, a lot of Vermonters don't have friends or families that can help them. This agency, the Agency of Human Services, and what you do, and all the organizations, especially in the mental health field, what you do are those friends. You know, you hear oftentimes nowadays that government is the enemy. And in the last 15 years, I've heard more and more of that. I, I don't buy that. Government is a friend in many instances, especially in what we do here at Human Services. You know, the issues that we grapple every day are, are complex, and we've got to be available to respond to the most vulnerable Vermonters uh, and work together in order to do that response. As a community and state partners, advocates, peers, and family members, we must all commit and continue to work together to ensure a strong mental health uh, system of care. I have told department heads a couple of things. One, bad news can't wait. And two, good news can wait. Uh, so, you know, I've instilled that in the agency that bad news can wait. So I can't wait. So I want to talk about bad news and some good news as we, as we move forward. First, the bad news, because it can't wait. We've got some challenges here in Vermont that we need to address. Wait times in EDs, and I just heard about a story about this, wait times in EDs for both adults and children and youth are unacceptable. We need to do better. Current trends in suicide rates in Vermont <coughs> that are higher than the United States rates, we need to do better there or the growing sense of hopelessness and despair that many of our young, young people and older Vermonters grapple with is something that we need to do better. And I gotta tell you, this shocked me when I saw some of the reports on the youth in Vermont and the pessimism about their future. It just, it really does sort of hit you when you read about that and think, what is going on here? The agency and the administration have clearly underscored the urgent and important need to strengthen our mental health system in Vermont. We've committed to forge a path to ensure fiscal stability to the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, you've heard a lot in the news lately about the Brattleboro Retreat. Uh, we are under discussions with them to put some fiscal stability into the Brattleboro Retreat. 12 new level one beds and the development of a 16 bed physical secure residential facility are underway. <coughs> Investments in suicide prevention efforts and working with our community mental health agencies to strengthen our proactive community crisis efforts for children, youth, and families through the mobile response teams. And this is a, one of the things we're going to experiment in uh, Rutland with mobile response teams. But, you know, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And we must look strategically at the future of our mental health system. I've said this over and over again, as we, we need to look forward, and where do we want to be in the next few years? And we must rethink the system of care and move towards a system where mental health and healthcare are integrated as we move forward in, in this effort. DMH, the Department of Mental Health 10-year plan, outlines the framework to, for, to begin to achieve this and improve quality and access to care for Vermonters. As I've always said, we have to keep, and then this is something else that I tell uh, our, the department heads within the agencies, we have to keep our foot on the gas. And, and we can't let up. Uh, this is hard work, 
but we're stronger together working together. And it's an honor uh, to rise up to the challenges facing our system of care and working side by side with all of you to strengthen it. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the time and the uh, uh, we've got We've got one problem, which is that we've got so many people here that it's a challenge. And I want to introduce Sarah from the state, uh, the Capitol Police, right? Yes. And she's going to talk about that for a second. I'm not even going to use the mic, guys. I just want to really briefly let you know that it's a really great thing that we're over capacity because of the awareness that we're bringing. However, it's also a danger to the people in the room when it gets so packed that we can't move and we can't open the doors. If something happens, there's a medical emergency or anything like that, we need to be able to gain access. Um, with that being said, we're not allowing anybody to save seats in here. If you leave, you need to take your stuff with you because when one goes out, one comes in. And we're, like I said, we're at that capacity level. I am gonna be sending in people to take up these seats that are available. So if you do have stuff in seats, please move that stuff. <coughs> if you leave the room, you are not guaranteed to get back in. I'm sorry if you have to use the restroom, but there's a lot of people waiting out there to come in. So again, if you leave, you're not guaranteed to get back in. There is a line. If you don't mind clearing out those chairs, I'm gonna go out and let some people in. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, a few people who were scheduled to speak have managed to get in the room. And uh, if it's all right, I'll start with the President Pro Tem of the Senate, Tim Ash, who is standing with yet another important senator. I'll introduce all three of you first, and then you can <coughs> speak, and, and two of them stop talking. Hi. I'm going to introduce all three of you. President Pro Tem, Tim Ash, Chair of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Jane Kitchell, also my senator, and Speaker of the House, Mitzi Johnson. And we're going to hear from all three of them. One more? Who's here? Did I hear one more? Oh, one more person, yes. Everybody happy you're not hearing that metallic noise now? All right. I'm going to speak loudly without the microphone so that you don't hear that weird uh, noise in the background. I might not go on quite as long as the previous speaker. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. I have to tease him from time to time. So my name's Tim Ash. I'm the president of the Senate. Uh, and as you just heard, one of the people who's in the room with me is Jane Kitchell. Jane is the chair of the Appropriations Committee, which is the committee that writes the budget every year. And the budget is where most of the programs that support uh, our mental health system come from. And I want to say that each of the last three years, while the governor's budget has not proposed increases in mental health services, the legislature, originating with Jane Kitchell and then working with our counterparts, the speaker and members of the House, we have made some of the most significant increases in mental health uh, funding in decades. I want to say, I, first off, I'm so impressed at how many of you have come here today. It's very rare to have a standing room only uh, audience here. Is to say that as you travel through the State House today, you're going to meet many legislators and people who work in state government. And most of them are going to say some version of this. Yeah, we really need to provide the support for people in crisis. We need to support the people who do the work, the people who work for our mental health agencies and work alongside their clients. We support the work, we value it. But the question I want each of you to ask those people oh, is this. Okay, then what are you going to do about it? Okay? It is not enough just to value the work and to value the existing system when we know there's so much work to do to build and strengthen and improve it so that we can improve and help people's lives. 
So that is the question I'm asking each of you to ask your legislator is, what are you going to do about it? I have to say on a personal note, this is the last year I'll be here in this capacity. I am not going to be running for a re-election because I'm running for lieutenant governor. So it's my last chance to say to you that ultimately none of this is about the legislators who are here today. It, our work is only based on improving the lives of people in this room. So when you talk to legislators, they act like they're too busy sometimes to talk to you. Their work is here to further the the benefit of your lives and make sure they hear that loud and clear. Ask them what they're gonna to do to support you and make sure that when you see legislators like the Speaker and Senator Kitchell, uh, Kitty Toll, the Chair of the House Committee, Ann Pugh, Ginny Lyons, and a number of the other champions of the issues that you're here today, for those people who have taken action and done something, they're the ones, give them a quick thumbs up and a thank you and encourage them to do still more. Thank you so much. from Senator Kitchell. Oh, no. No, I'm not, I'm not. You don't want to say a word? No, Jane is very shy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say very much. I used to be actually Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. I've been in uh, human services, social welfare programs, and before many people in this room were actually born. I started in 1967. So I have represented 50 years plus of commitment to improving the lives of Vermonters. Um, we do um, place a high priority on it. It is something that is very important to me personally. Uh, we do our best as we ponder and make uh, uh, commitments, and I think uh, our track record, as the Pro Tem said, has been pretty good over the last several years. It's a great pleasure to work with you. I serve, actually I'm now on the uh, board of Northeast Kingdom Human Services, so <coughs> I'm experiencing it from many different <coughs> angles. So thank you all for coming, and um, we will continue to work and do our very best. Hi, Mary. Hi. So. Now. <laughs> gotta go back to transportation. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, when the when the governor's out of town and the lieutenant governor's out of town, the next speaker is the governor. And last year, I met with her on uh, a day when that was the case, and I got a hug. I got to hug the governor. That's not always what I want to do, but it was a treat. And it's Mitzi Johnson, our speaker. Who's gonna... Hello, everybody. It, oh, that's irrelevant. Um, I will talk as loud as my voice will allow me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm getting the State House direct out of the way early in the session. <clears throat> um, it is my great pleasure uh, to, to present another one of the leadership, legislative leadership awards um, to Teresa Wood and Diane Lamper. <coughs> good things about you first. Uh, Diane Lamfer is on the Appropriations Committee. She and I served there for a number of years. Uh, she has more fortitude than I. She's still there. Um, and Teresa Wood has been a critical member for many years of the Human Services Committee um, and formerly with, um, was Commissioner of Department of Aging and Independent Living, yep. Disabilities, yep. Deputy, yep. Deputy Commissioner, excuse me, of, um, of Dale. Their, their experience, their passion, uh, and the knowledge that they bring to the policy work and the budget work is, um, is incredible. And they are lucky to have all of you here um, helping to 
feed your ideas and experience to them, and you're really lucky to have the two of them. They worked tirelessly this summer um, studying numerous proposals, attending I don't know how many meetings, looking at the new federal rules, looking at rewiring the payment model, improving accountability and transparency of the developmental disability system of care. The changes that are proposed are, are gonna have some of the largest on the ground impact since the closure of the Brandon Training School. And it takes an, a tremendous amount of um, volunteer hours, is what all of the summer work amounts to. Uh, to, to pour through those things and really think about how are, how, how are these rules and federal laws and intricacies on paper going to affect somebody's life? How is this going to help Vermonters live with dignity and independence and fulfillment? Um, and so <clears throat> it goes all of the work that they do goes way above and beyond uh, the call of duty that they signed up for in this. And we're so grateful to both of you for all of your work and want to come on up here. <laughs> Teresa, you are fierce and knowledgeable and so respectful in your ferocity of the people that you defend and who you keep in your heart every day. Thank you so much Thank for everything. You. Thank you so much. to stay overnight and whatnot so we don't have to drive an hour or two or more home. Diane and I have been roommates for years. Um, and so in addition to all of her incredible work during the session and every minute that she is in her seat, ready to go, books open, mind engaged on the Appropriations Committee, she is also that at home around the kitchen table in her pajamas, um, pouring over budget books. I know, things I'm not supposed to say, but I do. Um, and and you're that. so intense about all your details of work, and you do every, every minute of it with a smile. Thank you so much. Oh. And thanks for speaking up. I totally support what the pro tem said about about reaching out to your legislators, sharing your stories, and saying, "So what are you going to do about it?" Mm -hmm. These two ladies do it every day. <laughs> well, our next speaker, yet another luminary from our state government is Lieutenant Governor, he's running for something, I can't quite remember <laughs> what it is, Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. I, uh, I told Peter, I said, you know, I hug too. We all hug. Um, Thank you for having me here again uh, this year. And um, I actually, during the day while I'm in this building, I am, I am wearing one hat, which is serving as Lieutenant Governor, although I appreciate uh, the joke and other remarks. Um, I just want to say that uh, you've heard me say this before, uh, but ultimately, those of you in this room who either live with, care for, support, are related to folks who are uh, working with mental, health and recovery, uh, your experiences are experiences that many people in this building don't know and don't have. Some do, 
whether it be the two legislators that were just mentioned and, and honored, which is great. Uh, there's some other legislators who have direct first-hand experience. But the reality is, we as policymakers are very knowledgeable about what we know. But frankly, like everyone else in our society, there's a lot we don't know. We know a little bit about many, many other arenas. And whatever committee we're on, maybe we get to know a little bit more or what issue that we have come here with a passion to work for, we know more. But, and this is to really reinforce the, the Senate Pro Tem's remarks, we as policymakers, of which I'm no longer a policymaker as Lieutenant Governor, but I was for 18 years, so I'm gonna say <laughs> we anyway, um, really rely on you uh, for your experience, for your passion, for your knowledge that you can contribute to this process. I really want to emphasize this because the joke I, I often tell is that the whole reason I ran to be lieutenant governor is so that I would have one staff person. Because as legislators, they have zero. Yeah. They have zero staffers to do research, to do constituent outreach, to do anything for them, to schedule them. They are trying to juggle their life outside of this building. They only make 12 to 14, maybe it's 15,000 a year, which is not an only, that's a real amount of money, but it's not enough, as many of you know, to live on. And so they have another job. So they're juggling a lot. And their source of information, uh, as good as many of the advocates in this building are for these issues, is still limited to those few people and others who are advocating for lots of other things and lots of other needs that are needed to be met in this state. And so when they do hear from you, which to be perfectly honest, is often less frequently than we all want, on most issues, legislators get two or three phone calls or fewer. On all those bills you hear about in the legislature that go through the news, those are only a few high, high profile ones, and maybe those they get five or 10 calls on. <coughs> but honestly, people here hear from you and others so much less than what a vibrant democracy would have. I'm almost there. Um, and so I'm here as a cheerleader to you, uh, and I'm gonna ask you a question, and at first, Folks might go, oh no. Like, so if you don't raise your hand, it's okay, because I'm gonna tell you why in a minute. But how many people in this room in the last year have talked to your legislator or all of your legislators? Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, Allah Israel. Additional sponsors include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and international.